Let me say that again. The whole history of America is the history of rich white men telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown. It starts in the colonies of what would become the United States. Let's remember, during the colonial period, mid-1600s, there was no such thing as white people. I know some people who are now called white find that shocking, right? Because they think whiteness is real, right? But whiteness was created. Europeans didn't call themselves white. We didn't call ourselves white. We weren't all members of one big happy family. Are you kidding? Have you studied the history of Europe? The history of Europe was about killing each other. That's what we did in Europe. We just killed each other before we figured out there were other people to kill. We just killed each other, right? I mean, that was the history of Europe. The English hated the Irish, right? Northern Italians didn't even think that Southern Italians were Italians. The Germans hated everybody, and everybody hated their ass right back, right? There was no team called white, no race called white, but all of a sudden, in the middle of the 1600s, there was. Why? Why was it suddenly necessary to create this thing called the white race? Well, because rich people can count, that's why. And so rich folks looked around, the ones that owned all the land, you know, in the colonies, the colonial elite looked around and they realized something, that they were heavily outnumbered by African enslaved folks, by European indentured servants who were just one level above a slave, or other Europeans who weren't technically indentured servants, but they were still peasants, didn't have any money, didn't have any land, and they could do the math. They added it up and they were like, damn, we got to figure out a way to split these folks apart from one another or they're going to rise up and take our stuff, right? Right? Because after a while, these black folks who were enslaved Africans and these quote-unquote white folks who were poor Europeans are going to figure out they're all getting played by these rich people, right? So ultimately, the rich figure out they got to come up with some way to get somebody in that group on their team. The easiest thing is to get the poor Europeans, right? Because at least they look like you. They sort of share some of the customs and the culture. So they all of a sudden create this thing called whiteness, and they say, now you're part of the club. Now we're going to let you testify in court. Enter into contracts, vote, at least if you're a man, own a little bit of land, at least if you're a man, right? And we're going to get rid of indentured servitude, no more of that, because you're too good for that. And we're going to take the white men, now called white men, and put them on the slave patrol to keep black people in line. Give them a horse and a gun and a badge and make them feel big and powerful, right? They're still poor. They still don't have anything. They didn't pay the slave patrol well, right? Just exploited them, used them as a buffer between the elite and... The other poor folks, particularly poor folks of color, and pretty soon the rebellions that occasionally happened where black and white got together to overthrow the elite, those stopped because the divide and conquer had begun to work, right? You could turn people against each other by telling those poor white folks they got to keep these black people in line. And so that divide and conquer gets initiated in the colonies, rich white men telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown. Fast forward to the Civil War era. And you have, I'm from the South, right? My people, the elite in in, in my part of the country, right, actually announced that the reason they wanted to break away from the Union and possibly go to war with their brothers and sisters to the North was in order to maintain slavery and white supremacy. They said that at the time. We lie about it now. And we say it had nothing to do with that. But, of course, at the time, they didn't have any shame about it, so they just said it openly. Right? The vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, said that the cornerstone of the new government was the great truth that the Negro was not the equal of the white man. So that's the reason the Confederacy was formed and existed. But here's the trick. If I'm rich and I want to go to war to protect my ownership in other human beings, my property, but you're poor and you don't own any enslaved people, why the hell would you go fight to protect my stuff? Because I'm a rich person. I'm not going to fight. Rich people don't go to war. Right? Rich people get poor people to go to war for them, whether it's in 1860 or whether it's during the 1960s or whether it's today, right? Rich folks get doctors to write notes for them that say that they have heel spurs, and that's why they can't go to Vietnam. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, you can Google that shit because he's sitting in the White House right now, right? Well, I can't go fight. I have heel spurs. Send some poor kids to do that for me, please, right? So that's been a longstanding tradition. So the rich have to figure out a way to convince the poor to go fight for them. But that's a hard thing. That's like a hard sell, right? Like, how the hell, why would you do that? Why would you go fight to protect my property rights when you don't own anything? The only way you would do it is if that rich person comes to you and says, hey, listen, you got to you got to go fight because we got to maintain our way of life. Because if these people get free, they're going to take your jobs. No, fool. They already got your job. That's how it works, right? Because if I'm white and I got to charge you a dollar a day to work on the farm, 
but you can get a black person to do it for nothing because you own them? Guess who got the job? Free got the job, right? So in a sense, poor white folks would have been better off joining with black folks to overthrow the slave system. That would have raised the wage floor of all working people. But they got took, they got tricked by rich white men telling them that their enemies were black and brown. Fast forward to the 1930s. And you have white labor leaders. They're not even the elite, right? The labor leaders are not the elite elite, but they're the elite within the labor movement. And even they had fallen for it at this point. So they didn't want to integrate their unions. And they would say things like, well, we can't have black people and Mexicans and Chinese folks in our unions because if we do that, it's going to reduce the professionalism of our craft. We have to maintain the integrity of our profession. No fool, you need more people in the damn union is what you need. And if you don't let those folks in, guess what happens when you go out on strike? Who is the boss going to use to replace you? They're going to they're replace you with the very same black and brown folks that you didn't want to work next to, right? And so at the end of the and then you're going to blame them for taking your job rather than the white rich dude for giving it to them, right? Divide and conquer telling not rich white folks that their enemies are black and brown. And now we fast forward to the president. And we got the president of the United States becoming president on the basis of that same rhetoric, telling not rich white folks that the reason they don't have a job is because Mexicans took them, right? That's the argument. Keep in mind, there's been a net outflow of Mexican folks from this country out of this country in the last 10 years. Right now, border crossings and actual in-migration at the lowest level they've been since the 1970s. So anybody who believes that is a damn fool or somebody who does not understand how to do research on the internet or someone who doesn't care, right? But he says it, he says, the reason you don't have a job is those brown folks took them. 